Good evening. My name is Matt Lawless, and I'm the Scottsville Town Administrator. You're now viewing the Scottsville Town Council meeting video for Tuesday, February 16th, 2021. Thank you for tuning in here during the meeting. Uh, we've got our live stream uh, running for this evening and then um, archived recording uh, up on YouTube afterwards. So thank you for tuning in uh, in either event. This meeting is being held pursuant to and in compliance with the Town of Scottsville's ordinance on the continuity of government during the COVID-19 disaster. The public officials who are going to be electronically present at this meeting are the town council members, um, Lindsey Brown, Zachary Bullock, Daniel Gritzko, Laura Malusi, Stuart Munson, Eddie Payne, and the mayor of Scottsville, Ron Smith. Uh, the town staff are also present for the meeting. The public has several opportunities to observe and participate in this meeting. These are listed uh, physically at the entrance to the town office and on the town website. This meeting includes a couple of public hearings, which were previously advertised. Um, participation uh, will include the opportunity to comment on relevant matters. The time now is 10 minutes until seven o'clock, which is the advertised time for the start of the meeting. So I'm going to mute this line and shut the camera for 10 minutes and finish the setup. And then we'll convene promptly at seven o'clock. Thank you so much for joining. Good evening, Supervisor. Hello, how are you? All right, good to see you there. It's good to see you. So we're the only two here? We're just getting set up, yep. Let's go ahead and take all our actions and um, and seize the day. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll finish my setup here and see you shortly. Yeah, take your time, Matt.
Hi, Lindsay. Hi, how are you? Ooh. I am well, yourself? I'm very well, thank you. It was nice Good. to see some blue sky today. I know, isn't that just amazing? <laughs> for, for a day, we don't have snow everywhere, but then I think Thursday, we're, the forecast is for ice. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I actually, I just put a new deck on at my house, and I was talking to my daughter, and I think what I need to do is build a border around it and get a um, vapor barrier and fill it with water, and I can make an ice skating rink for my grandsons. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds fantastic. I might, I might yeah, copy I'm, that idea from you. <laughs> and then it, it, when the, it was her idea. I thought, that's just perfect. I'll have to, I think I'm going to look into doing that. I mean, I will say, and I don't know if it's because of the pandemic and having to be home all the time that Mm -hmm. um, I remember in years past, the winter just really getting to me. And I'm from New York originally, so it really shouldn't bother me that bad. But this year, no big deal. The dog wants to go out and play in the snow for a little while. I'm all about it. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to sit in the snow for a little while. So, you know, I'm, I'm with you. I, well, I'm not from New York. I was born <laughs> in Louisiana, grew up in Georgia, and then 25 years all around the world with the Navy. But um, every... February, I try to get away for a week because I just don't do winter well. Mm -hmm. But where are you going to go? You know, um, I was actually thinking about that the other day. And I guess maybe because it's just been different this year, but um, I haven't felt the winter blues, probably because my daughter and her family are living with me. So that's made a huge difference. But, um, yeah. So what part of New York? Um, originally just outside of uh, New York City, just north of New York City. So the, the summer. Manchester? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Brooklyn County, yeah. right across yeah. the okay. Hudson. So. Where, the, where the Tappan Zee Bridge is? Or yep. Isn't that the one here? Yep, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. but I've been in Virginia for 11 or 12 years at this point. So, and no okay. plan for going back to New York. No, it's a great place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there. So how long have you been down in the Scottsville area? Um, my husband and I bought our house, I think about eight years ago. So we've, okay. been, we've been here for a little while um, and love it. You know, oh yeah, uh, it's, it's a special little town, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, one minute. All right, and how are you ma'am? I'm well, Donna. How are you? I'm doing all right. Hanging in there is, I think, what most of us are doing. You know, um, we were just chatting right before you came on. I just put a deck on my house. It's a low deck. It's just one step off the ground. It's not like up in the air. And my daughter and her family are living with me. And she said, you know, you could um, kind of box it in and um, fill it with water and make an ice skating rink for the kids. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to have to look into doing that. <laughs> I don't know you'd get a whole lot of use out of that over years. Well, but you know, if, even if just a little bit, you know, they're, they're almost seven and three and a half. So it would keep them occupied for a while. But then I'll Oh, probably, yeah, that would be good. Yeah, I'll have to put a safety fence around it. And who knows how much work it may end up entailing. <clears throat> I haven't no, met you. Hello. Hey, Ron. Hey, Ron. You know, I was just looking at y'all's seal while we were waiting for everybody. And to the untrained eye, you would think that um, Buckingham County is north of Albemarle County, um, the way your seal looks. So it's kind of interesting. It, it has a southern perspective rather than what we're used to looking at maps with a northern perspective. Yes, indeed. I remember when I went to the Vatican years ago and we saw all of these maps with the southern, uh, the South Pole as the top of the map rather than the North Pole. And it really took a little while to kind of orient everything because we're so used to a single perspective. Mm -hmm. When we used to play, mm -hmm. travel, I always had to play upside down and now I don't know how to play right side. <laughs>
we have the we have the two public hearings that were advertised, but also the public forum time spot. Yeah. If anybody wants to speak to those and share anything else with us. Did Edna Anderson do the picture behind you of the? Uh, yeah, I was. I met her today. What a sweet lady. Oh wow. <clears throat> that was the airplane versus the drone days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Aerial photography is a bigger job there. Yeah. Oh, it is incredible what she's got. I think her nephew Howard took her up on his planes to take that. And then Howard is the only person I ever knew that his driveway had a sign that says his driveway doubles as a runway for my airplane. And he meant it. <laughs> he, had two, he had a J3 Piper. Looking for Eddie and Dan still here. And we got Howard, Howard Anderson used to raffle off rides in his plane over the town uh -huh. for different community auctions. And I was lucky enough to win two of them. Wow. Wow. That cool. Like that would have been fun. So Stuart's changed his background from fall. Yep. So I've got to be on official UVA now. I got to be okay. Scottsville. I'm switching hats back and forth. <laughs> Stuart, you've had a busy day. I have. Yeah. Was at the Economic uh, Development Authority before I ran over here. So. Literally. Are you actually or? running. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I went into into Charlottesville today. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, shout out to Matt here. He has got the uh, factory on the uh, Economic Development Committee radar. So they're looking at that as as uh, places to um, to advertise to folks interested in industry moving industry to the area. So. Chipping away at stuff here. Get stuff done. Yeah. And that's the county level economic development, not just the down the town, correct? Yes. Yes. That's Indeed. great. I'm leveraging them. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you do have a quorum yeah. uh, there if you want to go ahead. That's true. I did not hear anything from them today. Yeah. Uh, nobody's heard anything from Dan or Eddie. There he is. Is Eddie on? No there. There's Dan. There's Dan. Hey, Dan. Hey, I was having trouble again getting in. Looking forward to chatting with y'all. It's okay. <laughs> Let's, uh, while we're waiting for Eddie, let's uh, go ahead and call the meeting to order. And I'd ask you to stand and we'll pledge allegiance to the flag. Allegiance to the flag of the United States, United States of, America, of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. all. Thank you. Uh, let me have Thomas to call. Yes, sir. Uh, Councilor Brown. Here. Councilor Bullock. Yes, here. Councillor Gritsko? Here. Councillor Malusi? Here. Councillor Munson? Here. And it does not look like Councillor Payne is with us, but you do have a quorum, sir. Thank you, Thomas. <clears throat> Item two on our agenda tonight is the consent calendar, which consists of approval of the agenda, financial report for January 21, minutes from our work session and regular meetings in January. And the petition, uh, resolution petitioning DMV to consider us seriously for DMV select location. Do I hear a motion to approve the consent calendar? I move to nope. approve consent calendar. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, before we go any further, since we are privileged to have our supervisor. With us this evening, uh, Supervisor Price, did you have any words of wisdom for us? Well, I don't know about words of wisdom, but there are a couple of things I'd like to share with you. 
Um, I did have an opportunity to let um, the mayor and town administrator know um, in advance that um, tomorrow night at our board meeting, there are two items that are gonna be part of a, an action item on our um, agenda, which are of significance, I think, to the area. And I mentioned them, but um, really not gonna be in a position to be able to discuss them in any detail. But item number 11, we're gonna talk about CARES, coronavirus relief funding, and what the county may be able to do with some of those funds. And the two major items would be trying to expand broadband and we're working to try and get a convenience center in South Albemarle County. So um, I would encourage you, if you have the opportunity, go online, look at the agenda, look at the information that's been posted. Um, I need to let county staff do their presentation before reaching any sort of um, you know, formulation of specific opinions on it. Um, but I would um, ask if you have an opportunity to look at those items and please give me your input so I'll be as prepared as possible with Town of Scottsville considerations for our meeting tomorrow night. Um, with regard to broadband, Chantel has um, initiated their BEAM, B-E-A-M, um, service, which does provide for sort of gap is would be the way my, you know, um, non-professional mind would uh, address it. They can kind of fill in some of the gaps between the other providers. Um, they briefed us on this um, last meeting and the way I kind of see it is it's sort of an interim fill or interim fix while we continue to try and get um, uh, fiber um, throughout the county. Um, one of the things that we really are concerned about is um, the impact that weekenders have on um, uh, broadband usage through cell, phone, uh, cell, phone, cell towers and telephones. Um, and so while I think we need to increase the number of towers we've got to increase service, we recognize that when you have wineries, cideries, breweries, distilleries, meateries, and they have events on the weekends and visitors come, that those visitors using the wireless network detract or diminish the ability of local residents during those same time periods to have access. So while, while I see cell phone towers as providing a bit of relief, um, I'm convinced that we really have to get fiber um, to all of our residences and businesses in order to avoid that sort of diminution. And I think we've all experienced that if you've been at any major event over the last few years where um, so many people are using their cell phones, you just don't have any, any capacity. But um, I am very excited. I'm looking forward to tomorrow night to county staff briefing us, um, particularly with regards to um, the broadband and the convenience center. Um, I think there's a lot of support on part of the Board of Supervisors for both of those items, and that would be a Southern Albemarle Convenience Center. But again, I need to let county staff actually make their presentation and us ask the question. So any additional information that you might have for us is greatly appreciated. And um, Mayor and uh, Town Administrator, um, it looks like the weather Thursday is gonna be pretty rough. So we're, we'll just have to play it by ear for our regular post Board of Supervisors <laughs> To, to go over things. We may have to do that by phone or something if the weather's bad. Um, so that's those are the main things I have. I'm, I'm here to uh, at least try to answer your, any questions you may have of me. And if not, um, I'll listen to your questions. And if I can't answer the question tonight, I'll get an answer to you. So thank you, Mayor. I appreciate the opportunity um, to be a part of your meeting this evening. Thank, thank you for joining us. Are any uh, members of council have any questions for Supervisor Price? I, yeah, I, just, I do. Uh, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I do. Go ahead. Go ahead, Stuart. Hi. Well, I, relative to um, to broadband, my understanding was that we, the town, had um, had put out some money to get broadband brought down to Victory Hall, the library, and the police station, with the assumption that. Um, that broadband is, was then going to be extended to business owners in town. And I could you give me an update on kind of where we are with that, because I've talked to some, some business owners in town who have not been able to get fiber optic. Sure. That was uh, about a year ago now, if I recall correctly. We mm -hmm. yep. signed on yep. with CenturyLink. Um, we actually are only providing, we, we uh, signed on for a service that built into the contract the uh, 
infrastructure costs to bring the line to Victory Hall into the police station. Um, the existing network does already go to the library, but that has uh, nothing to do with us. Um, the thought of paying for it to go down to Victory Hall, I believe their terminus at the point was uh, uh, at the Harrison Street, Bird Street intersection. And so mm -hmm. we paid to bring it down that block and I think from over near the farmer's market up to the uh, police station. And we were thinking that that would just reduce the cost for other businesses in those areas um, that instead of having to pay themselves for that build out uh, from those points of origin, we had covered that initial distance and they would only, as it was explained to us by CenturyLink, they would be covering the cost of the remaining distance between their business and ours. Mm -hmm. um, now, if they're not able to get service from CenturyLink, that's that's not something I've been aware of, but that that was the arrangement that we made with them on the, the business fiber optic service. Um, as far as I know, that's only extending to businesses right now and not residential. Right. And Thomas, was that understanding in writing or was that? <laughs> yes, um, yeah, I believe that's all in contract. I mean, they, they, you know, the line is constructed down to us. It's brought there. And so uh, whether, mm, whether or not our agreement says that any other people would only pay from our point on, I don't know. I guess that would be yeah. a good question. It, m m off the top of my head, and Michael Culp with the county is really the right person to get the, the detailed information from, but you know, once you're within like 400 feet or 600 feet, somewhere in that range, um, the understanding is that um, it is covered. It's what we call the last mile beyond that. that I do I do remember that 400 number coming up that we were outside of that. Yeah. And that was part of our thinking that bringing it down to those places <laughs> would be bringing more people within that number. Yeah, so, but, but again, um, if you have a specific question to me, I can go to Michael or if you want to just directly go to Michael Culp um, at, Alb at albemarle.org. And, and Michael, who is Michael, sorry? Michael Culp. Um, okay. Yeah, he is our IT guru. I mean, he is amazing. And hold on just a second. I'll give you his email address. I think I know what it is, but I don't, yeah. It's M. Colt. M is in Mike, C is in Charlie, U is in Uniform, L is in Lima, P is in Papa. M. Colt at albemarle.org. Um, he, is, he is the guru of all things broadband. Okay. And I, the reason I brought this up was I was wondering if there's anything that we could do relative to the CARES money or... You know, what are some of the other things you were talking about? I think it's a great time to leverage. For, uh, to, yeah, I think it's a great <laughs> to bring time. bring this up. So. I think it is a great time to bring it up, and it is a question that can be asked tomorrow. Um, in fact, okay. I will go ahead and send an email tonight to county staff. Okay, um, great. And now what specifically would you like me to ask them about this in terms of the CARES money and um, fiber in Scottsville? Is there some way that we could use that money to extend broadband to the businesses in Scottsville since we've kind of taken the first step toward this? Mm -hmm. okay. um, and I'm not, I, as I said, I don't know that I have never seen the contract, so I don't know exactly what the phraseology of that proverbial contract is. But if it's a question of money, is there some way we could leverage this money to, you know? All right. I will I ask the question. And I'll copy the mayor and town administrator on okay. the uh, mail. We do. We also, Stuart, have the, um, uh, what is it, Nelson County Cable Project coming into town that's extending fiber down this way. And I think they're waiting on a VDOT permit to cross Route 20 a little bit north of town. Um, mm -hmm. And perhaps that's an area where the county could assist us. But um, yeah. I think that's all they're waiting on before they can sort of complete that hookup. And, and that should be another option available to businesses in the okay. near future. Businesses okay. and, and I think residents uh, as well. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. I wanted, that's what that was gonna be my sort of clarifying view, um, Donna, just sort of about like the lay land in general, because there are other things bringing fiber to our area. There's the electric co-op that's coming down Fluvanna right now, and they're going to come right up sort of onto the Fluvanna side of town. Um, and then the Nelson Cable Company guys, I had a conversation with them on the street as they were laying the line down Valley Street. And they're going to come right out East Main Street 
um, and then up Poplar Spring Road. And so wow. if, they get that, if they get that fiber turned on, and it will be, you know, residential. Um, I haven't gotten information from the Nelson Cable Company. I've called a couple times, to, but that can bring a lot of fiber into town. They've already got the lines being run. So, um, so I think it, it would be helpful for us in terms of understanding, just sort of understanding the lay of the land in terms of already who is moving into providing these things for, for the town. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you actually just mentioned one of our biggest complications that we have in Albemarle County that specifically in Nelson County, they do not have. Nelson County has a single provider. We have at least four, and now it might even be five in Albemarle County. And it is much more complex with what we've got. And it really is a patchwork quilt of areas that the different providers cover. Um, I was working with Mike and a, uh, and a resident off of Blenheim Road just this last week or so, <clears throat> and it, it was, it's very confusing. The zip code makes it confusing because, you know, 24590 goes way up, but 22902 comes around us. And on separate parts of Blenheim Road, there are different providers, and then there are gaps between them that really, it just it really complicates our situation. There's also something called RDOF, R-D-O-F, and I don't remember exactly what it's for, but it's a rural development fund for broadband. And some of those funds are gonna help us expand what we would otherwise be able to try and provide through the body, the Virginia Techn Techn Technology Initiative. So, I mean, Mike is really, he's juggling all these different balls of providers and funds to try and expand the coverage. Um, but one of the issues is, you know, we as the county don't actually provide broadband. Right. We work with the companies, you know, mm -hmm. just like we provide cell phone coverage. Okay. Um, um, and that actually does raise another issue that, that I'm working with the county on. And that is, you know, as I talked about earlier, the cell phone towers, um, they can help during some periods, but during the peak use periods of festivals or events, music events, there's so many people using it, it, it diminishes it. And one of the things that we have to really keep in mind is balancing, providing more services in the rural areas while at the same time ensuring that we have sufficient services in the development area so we don't expect pressure for development in the rural areas as people go, well, shoot, I'm gonna move out to the country um, rather than stay in the city. And now we've got extra development pressures in our rural areas, which makes our comprehensive plan of 5%, 95% more difficult uh, to, yeah. to meet uh, or, or stay with. So we have to make sure that while we're improving lives, the quality of lives of people in the rural areas, we're also making sure that the development area quality of life stays up so we don't end up you know, kind of undercutting our whole comprehensive plan, rural, urban development situation. Yeah, no, that makes sense to me. I'm just, you know, as we think about internet, the town of Scottsville is a little different from the rural areas of Southern Albemarle just because of our density. And so we actually, mm -hmm. we, that density benefits us in ways that we can get services that other people yeah. don't. Even the internet that's available now in town is better than what's available just, you know, immediately one or two miles outside. Right. And so yeah. as we, as this conversation about, you know, trying to get money towards, you know, expanding broadband and things like that, I think it's helpful for us to think about what's impacting the town so that the county can also put its money somewhere else where it's needed. For example, just in the mile or two outside of town, if let's yeah. say the Nelson Cable Company is going to yeah. have the town of Scottsville itself covered in a few months or, you know, the co-op that's coming in from Savannah. So mm -hmm. that's where I, I would like just sort of a better sense of the lay of the land in terms of these intersecting yeah. things so that I can talk about it a little more clearly um, because the town is in a unique situation. And if the Nelson Cable Company coming out of Nelson is fine doing business in Albemarle County as its own provider, okay, you know, I don't really care <laughs> my internet well, comes with me, um, if, you so, would, if you would... If y'all would like, let me also ask if Matt would be available maybe to, you know, make a presentation at one of your town council meetings to help, you know, address some of these broader issues for the immediate area around Scottsville. 
So uh, we'd be very happy to welcome any of the county um, subject matter experts um, on a work session like that. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Love to. Yep. Okay. Um, Thank you. Supervisor Price, before you go, it's unclear to me how much Mr. Culp and the Broadband Authority are working with the schools in regards to their um, proactive approach, their gap, their information. Do you have any sense of their partnership with the school board? I don't. And I'm, and I'm sorry I don't, but I will add that. That's in. one of my big questions because that's where a number of our residents are, are feeling the pain of COVID. And even when COVID goes away, we still have students and teachers that are trying to complete and access, you know, school system resources and homework and so forth. Mm -hmm. So if that's not addressed, it, that would be definitely a big question that I'd like to see answered. Yeah, I, and I'm hesitant to say much since I don't know the answer, but I believe right. that the board kind of has their own control over parts of that, but I will ask the question. Yeah. Uh, okay. Because I, I, I know the school board, well, when I say control, uh, legal jurisdictional control rather than provision of services. Right. I know the school system did a lot with hotspots. They and have, and with three providers stuff. that I know of. Yeah, at least maybe three or four but, cell providers. Yeah. Yeah, but even that was complex. I mean, how many kids are in a parking lot for hours and, you know, have access right. to the internet? Yeah. Okay. Right. But so they've done surveys, so they would have really helpful information for broadband authority and for the supervisors to consider um, in this mm -hmm. in this really helpful discussion. My other question is back to the convenience center. Do you do you have any sense of what kinds of services are being considered for the convenience center, just so that the public understands what's being discussed? Yeah, and in the uh, in the public materials that are already online and accessible to the public, it would essentially be the same as a convenience center aspect at Ivy, which is different than McIntyre. McIntyre is only recycling. At Ivy, the convenience center aspect of Ivy has both recycling and it has what they call the tag bag, $2 tag bag. Mm. So it's home, home waste, not commercial. It is not a transfer station. Trucks would not be coming in you know, even the small pickup trucks that do local trash pickup. This would just be household household waste. So, you know, your kitchen nice. garbage, your household trash, and your recyclables. The recyclables, of course, wherever we have recycling centers, will always be based upon what the market, market will carry. So, you know, paper, plastics, one and two, cans, that sort of a thing. If certain areas or aspects of the recyclable market close, then we won't be collecting those as recyclables. But for example, plastics, you know, plastic bags, um, one and two is what is currently recyclable. You know, fives and sixes are not. Those go in your, your either your trash or your garbage, depending on how you want to categorize it. So if, if we lose number two plastics from recycling, then they would be able to go into your household waste. But we're talking about, you know, basically individual residents, no commercial. It's not a transfer station. It's a convenience center. Um, you know, our neighboring counties, I think Nelson has six of them. One of the other counties, I think, has 11. Um, we have to do a better job. And this is both a quality of life and an environmental issue. Um, you know, when I drove out to Ivy last week, like anyone else in Southern Albemarle, you know, it's your 45 minute drive each way and plus the time. So you're, you know, before you know it, you've spent two hours um, and it's driving, you know, 50 miles of driving. Um, so if we can improve, if we can provide this, the other thing it does is so many of our Southern um, Albemarle County residents are really strained financially to the point where even just paying the $30 or so for the, the garbage pickup is too much. So unfortunately, a lot of people resort to improper means of disposing of their garbage, um, throwing it on the side of the road, burning it, none of, the, none of which are good for the economy or the beauty of the county. But if we can get this you know, established, then for a couple of dollars a week, people can take care of all their, um, their household waste. But again, I really need to stress, it's not a transfer station. It's not big trucks coming in. This is household Household waste is what we would be looking at. And the county will give us a lot more 
a discussion on this tomorrow night. Great, thank you. Okay. Anything else for Supervisor Price? We appreciate you in being with us and providing us the information that you provide us with. And uh, we will probably, you, Matt, and I will talk on the phone on Thursday. We'll look forward to that. Yep. And if y'all have other thoughts, let me know before our meeting at one o'clock tomorrow. And I'm going to work on that email now. And y'all have a good night. Take care. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Stay healthy. Next item on the agenda is the public forum. We have no public in the chamber here this evening. We do have uh, Ms. Carr on the uh, Zoom meeting. And I would ask uh, Trevelyn if she has anything she wants to bring before the council. Do I have any? At this time. No, I'm good, thank you. And we do have two public hearings a little bit later on uh, tonight, so we'll get to those. Mayor's report, I'm not going to repeat everything I've said at the work session because it's uh, stayed the same except for one item. Uh, and that is uh, last Thursday, I sat in on an interview process with a potential new uh, part-time police officer. So that was um, it was very interesting. The gentleman's retired and uh, he's still, uh, we can, if we can get him accredited in the state of Virginia, he has a lot of experience, knows a lot about uh, computer stuff. and. Uh, Looks like you would uh, be a good asset to our police department. So if anybody has any questions for me, now it's time to ask them. The only other thing I was gonna mention is, I don't know if you saw the article in the paper this morning, the Charlottesville paper. General Assembly passed that uh, provision for moving all the elections to November, which means our elections would happen in November, not May. Governor hasn't said whether he's going to sign it or not. I plan on dropping him a note in the mail tomorrow. And uh, if you feel like you want to uh, do the same, uh, please do. If you don't feel like you should involve yourself in it, what it will amount to if, it, if he signs it into law, we'll have to have another charter revision that we just went through the last year. And then we're faced with the uh, the situation where our terms expire on June 30th of so the two year people. And uh, I think it extends your terms. The election's in November, and we would be either shorthanded or have to pass some kind of provision to extend the term of people who would not be with us until January 1st. It's, uh, I don't think it's a very good idea because historically, uh, it's been the way we've done it here, and it seems to work. So that's my mm -hmm. sense, and I'll be dropping the, the, the uh, governor a, a note tomorrow. Do we, uh, Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. I, unfortunately, I think that's such a horrendously horrible and terrible idea. I wish that, not what you're doing, but what they're doing. The reason I say that is, I know it's easier, but one of the things that's nice to do is it separates the town stuff from all the state and national stuff. And yeah. it gets, it gets, we ended up, we ended up both being dwarfed by it and then tied into it. And I think that's extremely unfortunate. I don't know that we can stop them from doing it. What was, do you know the impetus behind how, why that ended up getting through that way? I forget to introduce the representative House from Virginia Beach, I believe, that uh, brought this before the General Assembly. I wrote uh, a letter to a representative of uh, Law Bill uh, expressing uh, my concerns and, and desires that it did not pass, but it passed. Uh, but like I say, the article this morning's paper doesn't indicate whether Northam has made up his mind yet or not. And uh, I'm with you, Dan, uh, you know, keep, when you get a whole bunch of stuff on a ballot, it, to me, it's, it can be confusing to a lot of people. And if we stick with one thing, like our town election and the people that are running for town office, then uh, it, it simplifies things for everybody in town. But I'll be dropping him a line, and if you want to do the same, please feel free to do so. Thank, thank you for bringing it to our attention. Thank you. 
Um, item number five, the course of committees. Uh, since we have public hearings uh, tonight, uh, which concern both ARB and planning commission, uh, let me ask Zach first, do you have anything other to report uh, or would you like to hold your comments until we come to the public hearing? Uh, I think it'd be worthwhile just commenting on, on how we're gonna move forward with poor rated properties this year following our work session, um, just sort of to recap that for everybody, just so we're all on the same page. But um, I wanna thank everyone for your, our discussion and, and time we, we dedicated to that, um, especially since now it seems to be becoming a, a town-wide issue. Um, I think that we have 17 properties currently rated poor, um, <clears throat> three of which carried over from last year, or three new from last year, 10 carried over from last year, and four of which we, we've had since 2018. Um, so this is, this is the largest number that we've had in town. I, I, I don't know if there's ever been a time we've had this, this large a number. And they've been, they're concentrated in areas uh, along East Main, um, Valley, and Harrison. And I think most concerning to me is the non-responsiveness of property owners. Um, I think the ARB should get a lot of credit uh, for its uh, attempts to reach out to members of our community and to work constructively with those who have worked with us over the last two or three years. I'm very proud of that work um, and the way that we have um, been in, in communication with folks. So the non-responsiveness is concerning to me because it means we're really just not even getting started in the process. Um, and so <clears throat> just as a recap, we're going to send out letters of notice as we always do to people who have properties who are rated poor um, with the same contingencies as always, which is requirement to meet with the ARB within 60 days to get a plan for remediating the issues. Um, the ARB does not need everything fixed. They just need the things fixed that'll bring it into being structurally sound or sealed. And for some of these properties, that's as simple as getting a window replacement. Um, so we're gonna do that as we always do. And we're also gonna be adding resources for property owners so that they can seek out resources that they may need if they need assistance. Um, and we discussed some of those at our work session last time. So that'll all go through um, with the letter this time. Um, and hopefully we'll get a good return. We'll be talking with uh, the property owners of 17 properties this year. However, um, we're also going to move forward with fining this year um, based on feedback I received from you at our work session. That at the end of the year, should we not receive any communication from a property owner, uh, the condition of the building remain the same, we'll institute the fine that is in our uh, ordinance to do so. Um, so that's where we are, and hopefully um, we'll be able to get some greater traction this year with um, maintaining these properties, which are really an essential component of what makes this town um, special and unique and a place that people want to go to, to visit um, and to live in. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for Zach? Uh, Lindsay, do you have anything to say before we get to your public hearing? I do not. Um, there are no additions or, or any other business at this point. Okay. Let's move on then to uh, Laura. Would you like to report on events and tourism? Sure. Um, before I do so, I wanted to give a quick update on also Farmers Market and Government Services. So Farmers Market opens on um, the first weekend in April, which is April 3rd. So put that on your calendars. Um, we, most of the market vendors are planning to return for the 2021 season and the market managers actually received six dozen new applications, um, which we're excited about. So there's some growing interest in the market. So that's a good sign yeah, for cool. us. Yeah. For government service committee, um, we spent our meeting reviewing um, a lot of the comparison Virginia um, digital town code platforms. The most common across the state of Virginia um, to outsource is called MuniCode. What we're doing next, that's the $10,000 figure that we've discussed in past work sessions in terms of if we were, if we were to outsource the town code updates. So the committee is um, going to proceed with identifying two to three towns where their digital format most closely resembles Scottsville in our current code. Um, and also that has the most up-to-date code embedded in it from the state level. So that'll reduce a lot of our efforts. For those of you that don't know, we do actually have some of our code already in a digital Word PDF format. So that's um, quite helpful. And then um, government services and the town clerk will help in, in reviewing that process updates next month. 
There was a lot of discussion. Um, government services is, is in support of the continued conversation about the real estate tax proposal. Um, our committee members to help that conversation will be looking at other towns to see how they use credits to incentivize tenants in vacant buildings. And right now it's, it's fairly difficult to define what's considered occupied versus unoccupied or how that would be distinguished between a, a location that might have an upstairs or downstairs or multiple shared spaces. Um, but we'll do some research, see what we come up with and report back on that hopefully next month. Um, government services has also had questions for town council in terms of um, if, if our current police force is meeting our, our needs right now. Um, so whether we've recently discussed the staffing and, and what our um, thoughts are on the increased cost of equipment as they move forward. So I didn't have a, a response for them, but just want to pass along. That's one of the questions that came up. And then um, we will also next month be looking at the capital um, improvements uh, plan and making suggestions or at least recommendations for where those reserve accounts, how they might be set up. So whether they're set up within the budget, whether they're just set up with the cash or whether they're actually built into the LGIP accounts. And finally, events and tourism, um, Scan and Matt um, are proceeding with a vacant storefront grant partnership application. We also have interest from Scottsville Museum and the Chamber of Commerce. Um, so we're working out the terms and how that all looks, but I think there'll be some forward mo movement on that. So thank you to those of you that shared the idea and that were supportive of it. We had a long discussion uh, again in the Events and Tourism Committee about what the town can do regarding commercial buildings that are in poor condition. So this topic is coming up in mul multiple areas and multiple committees. So residents are really concerned and, and noticing. July 4th is on a Sunday this year. Um, so the parade will take place on Saturday, July 3rd. Mr. Carr is already in the process of requesting necessary permits. We won't know if we get um, VDOT's approval until closer to the parade date. So plans are moving forward at July 30th, but it's all dependent on whether that permit gets approved by VDOT. Um, all of our 2021 events are, that we currently have planned are outside. COVID state guidelines may impact um, the James River Bateau Festival or our summer music events but all the other events are part of the farmer's market. And so the plan is to follow with the farmer's market guidelines from the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services as we continue into spring and summer. And then finally, we're seeking um, local business input on decorating contest for July 4th, Halloween and winter holidays. So we had several committee members recommend this. We kind of have tested it out. I'm gonna have some further conversations with local business owners to see if we can really get some buy-in and whether they think that's a good use of our time. Any questions? No, thank Any you. Questions for Laura? Appreciate all your committee has been doing and then we'll be doing in the future. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Anything yeah, else? I can. Yep. Economic development. Um, we have I discovered another uh, grant for um, uh, restaurants that have been in business for uh, more than two years and are small. So uh, got the, all of the information for that around to all of our businesses, all of our restaurants. Um, there's also another one I just learned about today that uh, might be able to help um, small businesses like Farmstead Ferments um, grow a bit. So I'll be getting information down to them. Uh, we are also um, in ongoing, continuing ongoing conversations. Um, with some folks who are interested in uh, some of the in, in buying some of the land around here, as well as the uh, uh, some negotiations on the plant as well. So there's nothing definite on that yet. So I don't want to be any more specific. But uh, but we're they're they're creeping glacially forward. So that's positive actually, and I think. Uh, so there is some interest, increasing interest in this area, and uh, and we are leveraging that as much as we can. Okay, any questions for Stuart? Appreciate your uh, representing us uh, in all the areas that you do. Uh, Dan, anything to report? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. One thing I would update those interested in the Van Cleef nature area this time of the year at the end of the winter, so not quite yet, but there'll be a time period in March, April, and May when there's our category A trout stocking brings a fair amount of trout. They actually stocked 
the lake on the 9th of February. They don't often do it in the middle of the winter. You can check on the website uh, to learn about what is available on the state website for trout stocking. But you remember, just a reminder, you have to have both a fishing license, state fishing license, and also a trout fishing license. But those out there in the town or those listening who are interested in Scottsdale Lake, it's a busy time in the springtime and we're looking forward to having people and their um, younger fishermen also or fisherwoman or anybody who wants to come out there. So please keep that in mind. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Dan. And with your, uh, with your West Virginia connections, I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, New, River, New River Gorge has been named uh, and put into national park status. I saw that. Yeah, yeah it's uh, 72,000 acres and it attracts uh, something like 1.3 million people uh, a season. And uh, it is now New River Gorge National Park. So that was that, quite an honor for those folks. Thank you for thank you for pointing that out. Whenever I talk about West Virginia, it's usually good. And I will say that that if you ever have a chance to be on the bridge that goes over the New River Gorge, that is quite an incredibly and in, in impressive sight. Yep, sure. indeed. And scary. <laughs> May I ask a follow-up question about parks and trails? Yes, sir. Just, and this might not be necessarily for you, Dan, but I know we discussed getting a sign for Valley Street for VCNA, yeah. and now that and I, I really think that's going to be, I think that's really important for us this yep, spring. Absolutely. Yeah, it, let me ask, yeah. let me ask a follow up, Matt or, or Thomas, do you all have any follow up on that? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, I've checked in with a couple of our um, vendors that are already on contract with that and um, they're getting me some pricing on it. We do have some of that within the existing budget. So I believe that's something we can get done this springtime, no problem. That's Perfect. Right. Thank you. My other question, I noticed the um, the company that's out here doing some of the land reclamation along the CSX line here on East Main Street, cutting back the grass and such today. Um, I know, and I know that's that's important. Uh, it's our Eastern Corridor. Um, there are people out there looking at the river today. So um, for our budgeting for next year, you know, I'd like, I want to make sure that part of that uh, discussion involves the cost of maintenance in that area because once they clear it and once they get the pollinators down, um, it'll, we'll lose it if it's not maintained. And so mm -hmm. I'm just curious what we can talk about in terms of making sure there's money for that. And that might involve just asking CSX for money every year to say, hey, we want your, I don't know, how, how much was it, $5,000? Um, to like pay just for the maintenance to keep it moving so that we can yeah. contract with someone to keep it that way. That's a good point, sir. I don't recall yeah. in my um, working budget whether we have additional CSX revenue continuing. So I will, ch I will check in with them and make sure that um, our budget accurately shows what we can do with that. Yeah, that'd be really great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next item is our first public hearing of the evening. It's on the uh, fences. Section amendment for fences on more than section 18.5.2. I will open the public hearing. There is no one in the council chambers to speak to that. Is there anyone uh, attending the Zoom meeting that we wish to speak towards the fencing uh, issue? Uh, there's there's one phone number on here. If we could ask them to introduce themselves, I don't know who they are. Um, hello, thank you for joining. If you'd like to speak to the uh, public hearing matter, you can unmute yourself. Okay, so um, any comments from anyone during the public hearing phase of the zoning text amendment? If not, I will close the public hearing and we will move on to council, council action on this matter. Um, can we just take a ask for a motion? Um, Mr. Bullock might like to introduce the matter um, or I can. Okay. Uh, either Zach or either you or Matt could uh, introduce uh, for the rest of the benefit of the rest of the council of what we're voting on. Sure. I'll, I'll do that. And then Matt can fill in the blanks as a zoning administrator, I guess, in this case. Um, but the purpose of this um, change to our ordinance is to bring 
Uh, our jurisdiction as an ARB over fences in the historic lay overlay district in alignment with our zoning, as well as with um, the current state of historic fences in town. Um, so what we're voting on is lowering the height at which fences fall under the purview of the ARB, which I believe, Matt, is we are now lowering it to three and a half feet. Yes. Uh, the purpose of that is because one of the things that we're concerned about in town is, is sight lines, especially along the front of buildings. And because of the topography of our own town, um, a, a tall fence or a fence of any size can in, in impede uh, the view shed of a street. Um, additionally, a lot of the historic fences in town are in fact three and a half feet on our current. Um, so if we, even if we wanted to replace those or make sure those were maintained, um, our current ordinance does not allow us to do that. Um, so all we're doing here is lowering the height to bring it into alignment with our current fencing um, for greater coherency as well as with zoning. Temporary fences and things under three and a half feet, including retaining walls, are still not under the purview of the ARB, though we'd love to talk with you about it. Um, and I think that's all I wanted to say about this. Oh, this also goes along with us updating our design guidelines for fencing, which the ARB had a special session on a few months ago and got some feedback from Middleburg, sort of a sister community about how they deal with historic fences. So we actually built out in our own guidelines, much clearer um, guidelines for ourselves for talking about fences in town. So I feel like we've got, we're in a much better place to have those conversations with property owners as it is. So happy to take on the extra work should lowering the height requirement bring more COAs our way. <laughs> oh, Matt, did you have anything to add? Let me just put the um, law text on screen share here so you can see the, um, the exact wording briefly. Um, can, um, can folks see my um, PDF screen here now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, as um, Mr. Bullock said, the ARB already updated their um, design guidelines, which they can do administratively. But there are um, two phrases in this section of the zoning ordinance um, that they approved the request to amend. Um, so that is on this page about um, minor actions exempted to be more clear about what does not need their review. So they, um, they delete the word uh, low, which was um, unspecific uh, and gave less than three feet tall as the new text. Uh, so that aligns it with building code. If it's a retaining wall that does not need a building permit, then ARB will also ignore and exempt it um, as, as you know the, the two rows of landscaping timber. Um, but as it gets to a higher structure, they treat it as a wall and want to regulate it. Um, the other change is here in fences about what we're saying for sure is a substantial alteration. Fences more than three and a half feet in length. Um, and that had, that had not been clear with a um, height limit previously. So those are the only changes to this ordinance. But then, so in this one, she said, take this number. Any uh, questions for Matt? Um, I have one question, and that is, um, you talk about view shed and strike impact with the fences. Does this, what is the impact in regards to landscaping? So tall bushes, shrubbery, trees, does that fall within um, this document, or is that not something that would go through ARB? ARB generally does not address landscaping unless it's part of a site plan with a new construction. That, yeah, so that's what I can say there. But you're right, a, a shrubbery or something like that could very easily grow into something that obstructs a view shed. Let me ask just to, it's, this generally seems like a, a good idea, um, but let me ask how it would, so I can better understand it, how it might, would or would not affect, um, for example, a fence that the, uh, the Scottsville Methodist Church just put in on their land overlooking the parking lot. Is this going to going to affect what they've done, just done, or is this only for things going forward? Yeah, so we rejected their COA for the fence that's currently there. And so they are in effect bringing, not bringing it down, but they are cutting it down to be in alignment with this, which I think they're bringing it down to four feet tall. It's not currently there. Um, and their new COA that we approved is going to follow the, the guidelines we created around pickets, height, and color. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. okay, any other questions? Do we need a motion to adopt these changes in the zoning text uh, amendment? I will. I move we adopt the changes to the code. Thank you, Stuart. I second that. Okay. There's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? We'll have a Yes, absolutely. Let me get my roll back up here. Sorry. All right. Uh, Councilor Brown? Yes. Uh, Councilor Bullock? Yes. Councilor Gritsko? Yes. Councilor Malusi? Yes. Councilor Munson? Yes. Thank you all very much. The motion passes. Thank you. Next item is the public hearing for 430 Valley Street, a special use permit. I will open the public hearing. Again, there being no one in the chat, Council Chambers here. I will ask if there's anyone uh, joining us on the Zoom uh, feature to speak to this. We see you there at 6175. If you'd like to unmute and have your say, please do. Now, receiving no comments from anyone here present or on uh, the internet, we will close the public hearing and we will ask Lindsay to uh, tell us what the council is voting on. Sure. Um, the special use permit for 430 Valley Street is the conversion from a uh, commercial space on the ground floor of that building to a residential slash commercial commercial space for a home-based uh, business of a seamstress who works on clerical uh, guard, um, for lack of a better term. Um, and uh, that, that's what we've got. Uh, Matt, do you have anything you wish to add? I've, um, I've spoken with the um, building owner and the contractor who's doing the minor renovation in the apartment. I have not met the um, entrepreneur who, um, as Ms. Brown said, is a um, seamstress um, who works on the, um, the special embroidery for the robes of clergy, um, which is a niche business, but not one that can fully support its own storefront. So this is, um, uh, the, that entrepreneur uh, is, is still interested and does still hope to move here uh, pending approval. Um, that's a, a business that generates um, drop off traffic and not a lot of walking. Um, so with that business proposal, I don't have concerns about um, adequacy of parking or any nuisance impacts from the business. Um, it does require special use permit for the, um, the ground floor conversion. Um, and then the home based um, business is something that I can permit uh, in there and take a business license as normal. The um, comprehensive plan, I, I believe, is supportive here. It speaks to a fine-grained mix of uses on the Valley Street corridor, um, which gets to the case-by-case um, -case basis of review. Each of these historic buildings is so different in its appearance and its scale that um, uh, I think it's reasonable to have this case-by-case -case review as you've got. This particular facade uh, doesn't have the big storefront windows and looks a little bit more residential. Um, so, so my judgment uh, in recommending a support to planning commission was that um, this conversion would fit in with a minimum of nuisance. Any questions for either Matt or Lindsay? I just have two clarifying questions. Some of it's follow up from the work session, but there's the second floor is still currently apartments, right? That's right. And that'll remain apartments? Yes. Okay, so we're really just talking about the first floor. Got yeah, it. It's Second the, question, mm -hmm. and this just relates, Lindsay, to the ongoing rezoning of downtown. If we rezone this with a special use permit, and then what impact, I guess, would a rezoning of Valley Street that's mixed use have on this special use permit? If you, if you were to loosen the zoning everywhere, it would... Um, not invalidate the special use permit, but but make it redundant. Um, but the 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 owner is asking for the permission under the rules that we have now 
if in the future we make it more permissive so that everyone can do this, then you know they're they're out the trouble with the paperwork, but it doesn't change their property rights. Okay, because I am interested in sort of you know the special use permitting zoning is is not super comfortable for me, but I like the direction of making a mixed use change to Valley Street. Um, and so if this permit is in alignment with that movement and such rezoning would just sort of make this special use permit go away or just integrate with it, I, I think that makes me feel good about voting for it. Mm -hmm. So I have two questions. One is a special permit tied to the specific resident business combination, or is it, on, is it tied to the address for an unspecified amount of time? <laughs> The, oh, yeah. the permit runs with the property, um, regardless okay. of how it changes hands. Mm. So the, um, if approved, the apartment conversion would allow any succession of residents and any succession of business owners to continue. The okay. home-based business part um, is, is a separate regulation of the towns where we look at um, the way the building is being used and the kinds of impacts of the businesses. So if the... Um, if the seamstress uh, moved on and the next person who moved in was a butcher who mm -hmm. was generating different kinds of uses and backs, we would have another opportunity to review the butcher's business, but the butcher would still be allowed to sleep live and work on the ground floor. Yeah. Okay. And is it, there, there are sort of, I believe four different sections of that address on the first floor. Is it that all, all those sections that are being transformed into this because it's the building is painted one color but that their businesses have been separate and so I don't know if 430 is half half the building the whole entirety front and back um, so that was also unclear to me for 430 is the um uh there are there are three storefronts on that um on the valley street side of the building the part that yes. used to be Atley church the really yep. the part that used to be Clayton Butler's wine shop Yes, and, mm -hmm. and ohm. Right, and so that one's 420, and 430, oh, okay. 430 is ohm. This application is only for 430. Sorry. For ohm. So it's only okay. for ohm, okay. Okay. So it doesn't impact the apartment that's on the back side as well then? Correct. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Any other questions? I'm gonna ask one motion to uh, from the council regarding this matter. I move that we uh, we approve the special use permit. And a second. Second. Okay. Thank you. Did we get a second? I miss moving. Okay. And uh, is there any further discussion? If not, then I'll ask Thomas to call the roll. Absolutely. Councilor Brown? Yes. Uh, Councilor Buck. Yes. Councilor Gritsko? Yes. Councilor Malusi? Yes. Councilor Munson? Yes. Thank you all very much. The motion passed. Thank you. And I'll ask uh, Matt to, to contact the property owner tomorrow and let them know that the uh, results of our vote proceeding. Yes, sir. Our third item uh, uh, under this section of our agenda is a uh, call for a public hearing on our next council meeting uh, March the 15th with a special use permit for 691 Harrison Street. Uh, who would like to just give an overview of that real quick? Sure, I mean, I can quickly, 691 is a, um, is a in, uh, detached, building with two uh, duplexes, would you call it, Matt? Yes. They're side-by-side -side apartments. Yes. Um, and the special use permit is for one of those apartments within that building to be turned into uh, transient lodging, um, aka for an Airbnb. And speaking with um, the with the applicant, uh, I know parking had been a concern, but they've worked something out with the church across the street. Uh, so no additional on street parking will be taken up by any, uh, any renters. 
and um, and that's the gist of it. Any questions uh, to, right now for Lindsay? If not, could I have a motion to uh, schedule this public hearing? And sorry, which building is this? I'm having trouble visualizing. It's the um, it's the is it yellow or white? It's the big farmhouse on the uh, on the um, right side of the street as you're looking up the hill on Harrison. Uh, there, there's, gotcha. there's currently okay. a zoning. Gotcha. There's currently a zoning uh, notice in front of it. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. What, what was um what was planning commission's action on the matter? Well, we suggested that we go ahead and and bring it up to to town council to uh, do a public hearing. Okay, so it's being duly advertised. Is there a motion to schedule the public hearing on March fifteenth? I'll make a motion. I'll um, make the motion to call public to... hearing. I'll second. <laughs> we'll move second in any further discussion. Um, could Laura, could you cite a date on that motion? For March 15th. Thank you. Let me confirm that that's correct. Holidays. Great. Uh, call vote, Thomas, please. Yes, sir. Uh, let's see. Councillor Brent? Yes. Councillor Bullock? Yes. Councillor Gritzko? Yes. Councillor Malusi? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Thank you all very much. The motion passes. Thank you. Uh, staff reports. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, much of the staff work in the past month has been related to budget development. Um, Vice Mayor Malusi shared the um, generous support of uh, Government Services Committee in working out some of the budget issues. And we had substantial discussion at work session this past week. Um, there are there are four small points of budget matters um, that I've been working in particular. Um, good news and bad news. Uh, the um, federal legislation on um, pandemic relief uh, is an important one to watch. The uh, the bill, the reconciliation bill, uh, currently uh, moving through both chambers of Congress, includes significant state and local government assistance, similar to the CARES Act, but with fewer restrictions on how it would be used. If passed, that would be very helpful to the budgets of localities like Scottsdale, but the, the total cost of that bill multiplied across thousands of localities is of concern to fiscal conservatives in Congress. So it's a difficult issue and one we're watching very closely, how quick we're able to pass anything and what the amount of state and local aid is. And then we'll try to run the division real quick to see what the, um, what the benefit to Scottsdale would be of anything that passes. Virginia Municipal League is very helpful in um, advocacy to Congress and also to providing updated data to us. Uh, we had good news from the Virginia Outdoors Foundation with um, award of an $80,000 grant at their, at their meeting last week uh, to preserve um, open space easements in Scottsdale. Um, our attorney, Jim Bowling, is um, in touch with the property owner on the um, necessary legal work for that. That grant would fund the full acquisition costs of the easements, but we would probably have to support the cost of a survey and some basic closing costs on it. So that's certainly good news and a vote of confidence in our comprehensive plan, uh, our small area plan, and all of the works of our, our Parks and Trails volunteers and our river partner, the James River Association. They were very happy to see that announcement. Um, in bad news on budget, since uh, last work session, we got a, um, uh, a package in the mail from a former distributor of our um, cigarette tax stamps. Um, these are the, the warehouse operators who um, buy the tax stamps from us and then provide the bulk cigarettes to the retailers here in town. Um, they essentially prepay those tax stamps, so they accumulate them. One of those middlemen uh, lost their contract locally. Uh, the retailer picked up a different distributor and they were left with $17,000 worth of town cigarette tax stamps that they had already bought that they're entitled to refund. Um, so they're um, requesting that $17,000 refund, uh, which they're entitled to under the law from stamps they bought years ago. Um, we don't have any recourse to that and it's an unexpected expense. Um, 
best you could say is the company by warehousing and temps for us was loaning us that money for a couple of years, um, but they need that payment now. And that's gonna be a hit on the current fiscal year, um, equivalent to 30% uh, of our cigarette tax revenue for the year. So those are the kinds of ups and downs that make a volatile budget difficult to manage. Um, we just got that news and we'll revise our um, current budget accordingly. Happy to take questions about budget matters or anything else we're up to. I'll just uh, elaborate on that a little bit to say that um, we are in the process of auditing their count on that. Um, I'll count each of those stamps and make sure that you know we have the same numbers before we release the check to them. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, as Matt said, uh, oh, and it's all been, uh, they were purchased within any change to our uh, cigarette tax stamp rate. So oh. we've double checked that as well. Um, but uh, as Matt said, they're you know completely within their right to request it, and uh, what it works out to for us then is the interest-free loan of seventeen thousand dollars over the last, I think it's six years. They bought them in two thousand fourteen. Okay, any questions for either Thomas or Matt? They bought them in two thousand fourteen, and left them. That's right. And Isn't there like a statute of limitations on this or something? I, I think without the change in price, well, we could ask Jim that before we release the check. That's that's worth the due diligence. But yeah. um, it 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 seems like it it might not be. It, it seems likely that we will have to send this check. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know I'm grasping at straws, but it's worth trying. Yeah, definitely be worth asking. I'd, I'd be curious yeah. to know. I'd be, I'd be curious to know. Sure, absolutely. That's yeah. a long time. That's just a long time to have them. Yeah, for accounting purposes, that just seems use them. It falls right in line with the um, you know, the BBNT return that audit that we received a couple of years ago was for a time period that extended back a similar amount of time. Yeah. Um uh but um yeah, it is an odd situation. And I think this is, you know, we, we got the message without the quantity first that there was a return coming and i think matt and i were we're both expecting this to be much smaller uh considering that most of our current vendors are purchasing this one or sometimes two rolls at a time um i, I wasn't expecting anybody out there to have a stockpile of uh 50 000 tax stamps um <laughs> <laughs> so uh hopefully they're the only ones is that um is that like a thing we should think about like like when, like when we give them out, like, is there a number? Like if someone asked for 50,000 tax stamps at a gush, we'd be like, no. It, it's an interesting <laughs> point. Um, I, I think that that is probably the smallest unit that it makes sense. And that's kind of what we're seeing for most people buying one at this point and some still buying two. Um, uh, I don't know how they got three. I was going to say, but that's certainly, I mean, we're, we're getting close to the point of repurchasing and that could be something that we talk to the vendor about as we're getting these reprinted. Um, mm -hmm. Is it possible to, to do them in smaller quantities so that yeah. people are only buying, you know, $2,500 at a time instead of $5,000 worth of tax stamps at a time? Yeah, um, I feel like that would be a cool, that, would, that, that sounds like a helpful way to go. Absolutely. Yeah. At least limits our liability. Yeah, I mean, at least a year, you know, if you can estimate what a year, two years, because the numbers are fairly consistent. So they are, and we're seeing the same vendors come back within a period, I would say, of, of three to six months, depending on the vendor, uh, to, to repurchase their individual roles. Um, so, you know, we, we see within a fiscal year, uh, the same vendors come back a number of times, which again is why, you know, I, I really wasn't expecting that anybody would have had four roles out there. Um, but uh, yeah, getting a little more information as the package came in that they had um, lost their accounts in this area and had just been sitting on this. It sounded like a much larger regional supplier. I don't know if it was Dollar General or Food Lion or it sounded like one of those larger chains that was probably um, buying them in bulk for a, a specific account here and then the account dropped and, and they got left holding the bag. Mm -hmm. But I will see what our options are. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else anyone would like to bring up?
Yeah, I'm just now so fascinated about our cigarette tax procedure now. So <laughs> when we lose, so a distributor is working with Food Lion. So, right? So like Food Lion has a distributor for cigarette taxes. That's right. We don't sell cigarette taxes to Food Lion. We sell them to uh, J.D. Davenport, I think it is. Right. Uh, but, but Food Lion, just as an example, is still selling cigarettes, even though they dropped the distributor. Yeah. So they we- changed from, you know, AD USA to JD Davenport or whatever, you know, they're, they're switching suppliers around on the back end that doesn't really affect the customer buying the uh, pack of cigarettes. Exactly. It changes who's writing us a check for the cigarette tax stamps that need to be put on each pack of cigarettes there. Mm-hmm. So, why if, the new, so why isn't the new supplier buying our tax stamps? That's they are. The, the new supplier is still, it's just, they, you know, the, the old vendor is not authorized to sell them to the new vendor. There, there's not a transfer that way. And so the old mm-hmm. vendor sells them back to us. And presumably, you know, we have already mm-hmm. sold this quantity of tax stamps to the new vendor since whenever mm-hmm. this change happened. Um, we just nice. didn't know that that's what was happening. Um, yep. You know, they, they bought in advance of what they needed. The new vendor has probably already gone through a similar number in that span of time. I see. This but is, we still have to honor the refund. Cigarette is unlike all of our other taxes because it gets paid in advance of the, of the retail sale. It, it's a consumer tax similar to that meals tax. And, you know, we're relying on the businesses to be able to bring people through the door who want to do this transaction. But yeah, yeah as Matt said, it's, it's different in that upfront uh, sale to the uh, distributor. Okay. Is it, is it worth reaching out to the new distributor? Is that information to find out to see if they're in need of additional credits or, or tax? <laughs> I, I don't think so because we really didn't even know that this switch had taken place. Everything, you know, the the purchasing seems to be rolling on a pretty regular. In uh, last fiscal year, we were even, we were like five thousand dollars below our projection up until the last, you know, two weeks of the fiscal year, and then the last check came in. It was really sort of perfectly timed out that all of this is, you know, falling in place in a re- in a pretty orderly purchasing pattern. Um, uh, so yeah, somebody picked up the slack as soon as, as you know, the accounts changed hands. Um, we just didn't, didn't know about the, which, yeah, if they had pre-purchased that many probably looked like a spike in revenue to us. Uh, but that would have been, you know, four or five years ago, whenever that happened. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, maybe when Tyra Fuel gets online, that'll pick up a little bit of the slack. That that would be another account. Uh, yeah, yeah, somebody else buying yeah. stamps here. Um, I I don't know if that works the same as, like our our market surveys of restaurant sales have shown that we have room when new restaurants open. They're not stealing business from one another. We don't mm-hmm. have any research that sort of shows if, you know, the all the smokers who buy their cigarettes in Scottsville are already doing so, and if more opportunities would result in more sales. Or, or vice versa. Got it. Okay, anything else from anyone? Um, I, I just wanted to, to share with council and staff, I did a, a inquiry with another DMV select in the area who um, town staff hadn't mentioned and just sort of asked how, how their business is going. Yeah. Um, so they, um, they are sometimes profitable. They have two employees that are constantly busy hours a week especially the first and the end of the month um they so in addition to direct customer service um their their transactions include daily entries and deposits the dmv required reports and lots of training so it was really interesting is that dmv employees they have to go through initial training they have required in-person training in richmond but every time the legislation changes there's new training that may be in person or maybe online for DMV staff. So that's just a constant and some years are busier than other years to depending upon how active the legislation is that impacts um, the records that they, that they process. Laura, if I could interrupt just for a sec, yeah. they did say in our meeting that um, due to the COVID stuff, the, the week of training in Richmond has been replaced. Is virtual this year? Well, a combination of virtual and they'll send someone out to you. Um, oh, so that's it, nice. It, it's a little bit of both. Yeah, but it's working a little differently. <laughs> One of the neat things to hear about though is that training is where they create, they kind of create this DMV community amongst themselves so that mm. the different selects offices get to know one another. Um, so that was kind of a surprise. 
um, the manager's recommendation is whoever is hired, if this proceeds forward, has to absolutely love the public. It is so critical in that role mm -hmm. that they, that has to be like one of the number one criteria for that job. Yeah. Um, so, in a, so the, the equipment she did mention, and I know that Matt and Thomas mentioned this too, there's the printer, the copier, the computers, but she said that the ink is extremely expensive. So they go through ink yeah. very quickly on the printers and the copier. So consider that in the budget because it's a constant expense and it's not just your regular printer cartridge. It's the hefty, hefty cost. Okay. Um, and overall, I just wanted to say that I look forward to hearing as that conversation goes forward. Um, I think the, the idea, and I appreciate sort of the innovative observation by the staff and the inquiries. Um, this, the DMV Select idea has the opportunity to really bring some new service to our town residents, to encourage um, others to frequent our businesses. Um, I think having additional office, office staff will be helpful, but I, I now after talking with a couple of different DMVs realize they're gonna be really busy. Mm -hmm. So one of the concerns <laughs> that I'd like to ensure as we go forward with this conversation is, is to have conversations about how we ensure that we're still meeting our town capital needs, our other staffing areas and our other priorities. I don't wanna get sidetracked or lose sight of the things that we've talked about, whether it's the CSX maintenance, whether it's the trail signs, whether it's you know making sure that the market doesn't have pigeons that nest in it again, um, <laughs> or or an extra set of hands for maintenance. So just just want to keep that in mind as we move forward. But just wanted to share that. Thank you, Laura. Can I ask what town that was that you spoke to? Uh, um, yes, I called Dylan. Oh, okay. One of the private because uh, yeah, they have their own sort of network and we're nestled in between them. So I thought they'd be a, a great resource to. to I thought it might have been, um, yeah, the, I didn't reach out to them or the one in Palmyra. Um, yes. I was only going around to places that publicly publish a budget, but yeah. uh, thank you very much for doing Yeah, that. you're so welcome. It was a great conversation. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, thank everybody this evening. Is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. A second. And is there any discussion on that? If not, all in favor? Bye. 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 <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Bye. Mm -hmm. Have a good evening. Stay healthy Thank you all very much. You too. Yeah. Bye bye. Good night, bye. everyone. Good night.